Hi, this is Mrs. Hall, and today we're going to be talking about humanistic theories of personality. If you remember back from Psych 1, we learned about the humanists and what they believe about what drives our behavior. And just as a review for us, here are four things that the humanists believe about our behavior and the reason we do the things that we do. First of all, they place quite a bit of emphasis on the unique qualities of each individual person that each person is his own self. He doesn't have to be like everyone else. We each have potential to grow as an individual, as a human being, and we're able to grow by using our free will. And just the idea that we are each in control of our own destiny, no one else controls that for us. And this was in stark contrast to the behaviorists and the psychodynamic theorists that were prior to the humanists emerging because they believed that we were completely controlled either by our unconscious mind or by the environment. And the humanists said, no, we each are in control of ourselves and we can each make our own rational choices to become the best person that we can become. The first theory that we're going to look at with the humanistic theory of personality is Abraham Maslow's self-actualizing theory. Now this is probably familiar to you. I'm sure you've seen this hierarchy of needs before. But what Maslow believed was that our personality develops as a result of our progression through this hierarchy of needs. And you do need to be familiar with each one of these different levels and what things that we're striving for at each one of these levels. So the way this works, according to Maslow, is that we have needs in our lives that we are striving to fulfill. And so we start at the bottom, we all start in the same place, and the very bottom of the pyramid you see is these physiological needs. Things like food, water, shelter, the ability to breathe, warmth, things that will physically keep us alive. And once we're satisfied at that level, and it doesn't have to be complete satisfaction, but it has to be at least adequate satisfaction at this level or any level, it'll activate the needs to become more important at the next level up. So once our physiological needs are met, then we're going to move up to the safety and security needs. And now we're talking about not just survival, but we're talking about ways to maintain those survival needs at the physiological level with a place that we can feel safe and we can feel secure, we can feel like we're taken care of and can survive. So this would definitely be our health, that we want to feel secure in our health and, and how we are living our lives. But it also includes things like where we work and where we live. If we live in a place that we don't feel safe, that's going to be taking up the majority of our energy on the pyramid, that we're going to be striving to meet that need for safety and security if we're feeling unsafe in our own homes or in our employment if we're feeling like we're not in a safe environment or a secure environment, like we could lose our job at any time, things like that. It's going to thwart our ability to move up the pyramid. But once we live in a place where we do feel safe and secure, then we can activate the love and belongingness needs. Now these are the needs to just feel like we fit in somewhere. Friendships, family, intimate relationships, having a sense of connection with some sort of a group, a team perhaps, or a school that we belong to, and just feeling like we're connected to someone, somewhere. Most of the people that you know are in this love and belongingness place on the hierarchy. So most of us have our physiological needs met. We're clothed and we have food and we're living. And then we, most of us live in a safe place where we can go home and we can feel like our life is not in danger. We have good health, things like that. And so now we're looking for a place to fit in. And that's where we find a lot of adolescents at this age, just looking for those friendships, trying to find that sense of identity. Where do I fit in? As we move into the green level that you see here on this picture, we're looking at the beginning of what Maslow termed our growth needs. Now we're looking at our esteem needs, and this is that need to feel successful, need to feel like we are achieving something, that other people respect us, that we are doing things that are worthy of acknowledgement. In this level is where we gain our confidence in who we are and that continued development of our personality and our self that we're going to be talking about in a couple slides. The final level of the hierarchy is what everyone is striving for, and that would be called self-actualization. Now this is the idea 
that we have become the absolute best version of ourselves that we can become, reaching that highest level of personal growth and of potential that we have as an individual human being. These are some characteristics of a person who is self-actualizing. And there's debate as to whether anyone ever fully self-actualizes because the question would then remain, where do I go next? So it's sort of believed that once we're at that self-actualizing level, we continue to work on self-actualizing even more. So here are some characteristics of a self-actualizing person. These people have a very clear view of life of what they want, of who they are. Secondly, these people are less emotional and more objective to things that occur in life. They are less likely to allow their emotions to distort what is real. So instead of reacting to something and misinterpreting what happens, they look at things more objectively and allow themselves to simply respond to the things that happen. Another characteristic that is very important when a person is self-actualizing is the idea that they are dedicated to something greater than themselves. That they are dedicated to some sort of a vocation or a cause, something that they feel will benefit others. They're very selfless and look outside of themselves and want to help others and want to make the world a better place for others. Some other characteristics listed there at the bottom, these people tend to be very creative, spontaneous, courageous, and hardworking. The second of these theories in the humanistic theories of personality is Carl Rogers' person-centered theory. Now, Carl Rogers was a therapist. He was a counselor, and he developed his theory more as a therapy than as a theory of personality, but other humanists have applied this to personality theory as well. And the main idea here for Rogers is that we're all capable of growth, which every humanist believes, but Rogers believes that in order for that to take place, we need to be in what he calls a growth-promoting environment in which we can become that best version of ourselves. He agrees with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but he believes that in order to self-actualize, this growth-promoting environment is going to be key. Now, there are three characteristics, according to Rogers, in his growth-promoting environment. The first is that the environment is genuine. And by genuine, he means that it's open, it's real, it's a transparent sort of an environment. It's one where we are able to disclose things about ourselves in a non-threatening way that people won't judge us for the things that we say, but that it's real and loving and that the things we say are accepted and we feel like people want to work with us. I mentioned this already when I was talking about genuine, but the second characteristic is that it's an accepting environment. And the term that Rogers uses is called unconditional positive regard. And what he means by that is that the person feels like no matter what I do, I will still be valued as a human being. I can make mistakes, but I'll still be accepted and understood that people do make mistakes and I'm doing the best that I can. And just because I make a mistake, I'm not going to be judged and condemned. So it's a very accepting environment. And thirdly, it's an empathetic environment where we feel like others care about us and they understand us. Even if they don't completely understand us, they try to. They try to put themselves in our shoes and see things from our perspective. Now imagine if your parents, and I hope a lot of your parents do treat you this way. You live in a home where it's a real place that you can be honest with your parents and they're still going to love you no matter what and they're going to accept you and at the end of the day you're still going to have a place to come home to with people who love you no matter what you do. It doesn't mean that they're not going to get upset over mistakes that you make. No matter what, they're going to love you and they give you that unconditional positive regard. They show you that you are valued despite your shortcomings at this point in your life, and they're very empathetic. They try to understand where you're coming from. The second part of Roger's theory is his idea of self-concept. Now, this is different than self-esteem. Self-esteem is how I feel about myself. Self-concept is the beliefs that a person has about himself. What do I believe about who I am, about the things I can do? Our self-concept is influenced by our childhood experiences and 
by other people's judgments or evaluations of us. Now our self-concept is very subjective because we're the only ones who have it. And we're striving for congruence in our self-concept. And what that means is that there's a consistency between who we see ourselves as, our actual experience, and what we are striving to become which Rogers called the ideal self. So if you look at this picture down here on the right, you'll see a little boy who thinks that he's a good person. That's the way he sees himself. That's his self-concept. His ideal self is that he would like to be a good person. Therefore, he has a congruent self-concept. Incongruence comes when there's a gap between our self-concept and reality. When our ideal self and our actual experiences or who we see ourselves as are not lining up. If you look at the bottom left picture, you'll see a person looking into a mirror experiencing extreme incongruence where the actual reality, the actual experience is that the person is very thin and yet their self-concept is what they see in the mirror that they appear to be very overweight. So this is an incongruent self-concept. And I really like Roger's quote here in the middle, the curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. The idea here is that we don't just rely on other people's evaluations or judgments of us, that we look at who we are and accept ourselves where we are, and then we can get closer to becoming that ideal self. If I want to be a good person and I'm doing some things that are not such great things, maybe I pick on my siblings, maybe I punch my brother when I'm mad at him and things like that. Well, that isn't what my ideal self sees as a good person. So if I accept myself as you know what I make mistakes I am gonna make mistakes because I am human I'm never going to be perfect but I certainly can change and I can become a better person and we experience more congruence then we can start making those positive changes and we can start moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs a couple things that I just wanted to add into this lesson Rogers believed that children are optimistic by nature that we're all born optimistic and seeing the good in everything and if they possess a strong self-worth or self-concept they will be empowered by a feeling that anything is possible and his point here is that we want to keep thinking that way that's our goal if we want to self-actualize then we want to keep thinking that anything is possible we want to keep thinking that we can continue to change and grow in a positive manner when I was talking in the previous slide about other people's judgments and evaluations of us, the second quote here, everybody does not have to like you. That's not their job. Liking you is not anyone's purpose in life except yours. You need to be the one to like yourself. And once you like yourself and once you accept yourself, then you can move forward. Evaluating the humanistic theory, what are the pros and cons? Well, positively, the humanists focus on conscious experience and they stress human freedom and individual uniqueness, which no other theory of personality does. No other perspective really focuses on these things. But the problem here is that each person's conscious experience is subjective. We don't have an objective way to view how our personality develops and how we're going to become that better person. The other thing is that this theory doesn't explain or predict where our personality traits come from, except to say that we're moving up that pyramid, that hierarchy of needs, and the growth promoting environment allows us to do that. It doesn't say where these things come from in terms of the way we're raised or the genetics that we're given, our biology, things like that. So those are two of the major flaws with this theory when we're talking about how personality develops and how we maintain it and the consistency and stability over time of our personality types. So that takes us through the humanistic theory, and we will be working with this in class. We'll be applying it, and if you have any questions, make sure you either email me or, as always, you can ask me in class, and we will make sure we clarify all these things for you.